Welcome to an Ultralight Airplane podcast video from the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. This video is a little bit of an experiment. I haven't done this style of video before, so it's intended to be, as I said, a podcast. So all you're going to see is a video of me talking. So there won't be any slides, there won't be any equations, there's no design. But what we will do is discuss whether or not it's worthwhile putting a parachute on an ultralight airplane. But more specifically, ultralights that are high drag and low weight, like they are here in the U.S. under Part 103. Now what inspired this video is a post that I saw on Facebook on an ultralight airplane group oh, sometime earlier this year, where someone was trying to actively discourage people from putting parachutes on their ultralight airplanes. So I want to go over, in general, kind of paraphrasing what this person had put in their post, whether or not I agree with them, and also consider some of the things that this Facebook poster did not mention, did not consider. Now, just in general, real quick, what this Facebook poster was saying is that if you have good airframe and engine maintenance, you do good walk-arounds on your airplane, in other words, pre-flighting it, and you have good pilot skills and good decision-making, you don't need a parachute. What I would like to do is go into a little more depth, a little more detail of each of these points and see if the conclusion of this poster was reasonable. Now these three general areas that this poster mentioned, I'm going to go into them in some detail, but what I'm going to talk about is not exhaustive. There's a whole lot more that we could talk about, but I don't want this to be an overly long video. And it's more towards parachutes, whereas when we're going over this posters ideas and going into details it's not directly applied to parachutes and indirectly is so I don't want to go into too much depth so let's start with good maintenance on the engine so one of the ideas implied by this Facebook poster is that if you have good maintenance on your engine you don't need a parachute at least that's part of it so it's involved in good maintenance on the engine well number one you really need to keep track of the hours on the engine how many hours since you did certain maintenance items on the engine. And you can do that a couple of ways. One is to keep good track of the hours that you're flying, marking down in an engine logbook, and then also when you do maintenance on the engine, marking down what you did for the maintenance at that time. In other words, the logbook time, the engine run time. And then another way is to have an Hobbs meter or something like a Hobbs meter. A lot of engine management systems will have something like that in them to keep track of the number of hours that the engine has run. And then still in your logbook, you would want to put the hours on the engine when you did certain maintenance items on the engine. So it'd be things like changing air filters, changing fuel filters, changing spark plugs, just kind of regular maintenance. Every once in a while, you just have to go through and do these things. Air filters will get clogged. You can either clean them, replace them, Fuel filters should be replaced every once in a while, and they should be inspected to see if there's any debris in the filter. And of course, spark plugs do wear out, and they have to be replaced, or they have to be re-gapped sometimes, changing the gap on them so they have good spark. And then on engines that have oil filters on them, or have oil for lubrication, like most four-cycle engines do, you got to change the oil on a regular basis. You can't let it go too long. Engine oil only lasts for so long before it needs to be replaced because it will stop lubricating well. It starts getting clogged with carbon, and that's not good. And then when you change the oil filter, you should cut it open and see if there are any metal flakes in that oil filter. Some engines have a magnet on the oil change plug. You should see if there's any metal filings that are showing up on that magnet. If there are, that's an indication that your engine has a problem, and it's going to need some extensive maintenance, possibly an overhaul. And that brings me to the next item. Your engine has to be overhauled every once in a while. There's a certain lifetime for that engine between overhauls, and you don't want to go over that lifetime. So what's the purpose for this maintenance? Well, it's pretty obvious to us. It's to keep the engine from failing when we're in flight. Now, this portion of this Facebook poster's comments is probably the most important. And that's because engine failures are kind of the initiator of the primary cause of aircraft accidents and that's loss of control going into stall spins now why did the airplane go into a stall spin that's because the pilot let the airplane get too slow or the pilot was in a turn had an uncoordinated turn so how did the pilot get into that situation well of course what initiated it was the failure of the engine but how did that lead to either uncoordinated control 
or letting the plane get too slow. Well, we'll get into that just a little bit more. It's going to come up in pilot skills or pilot training. But it's very likely the pilot wouldn't have lost control of the airplane if the engine hadn't failed. Now, when do engines fail? Well, for us ultralighters, it's frequently when we're taking off or landing. So we're at low altitude and there isn't time to recover from loss of control of the airplane. And we're, we're talking just a few hundred feet above the ground. So now we get into the first question about whether a parachute would have helped in this situation. Well, if you're only two to 300 feet above the ground, then the answer is probably no. The parachute probably would not have helped you at all. Because number one, it takes time for that parachute to open. And you're gonna be losing altitude during that whole time under your expected condition when you're in a stall spin because you're dropping during that event. There have been a few rare cases where a parachute deployed under 200 feet has succeeded in opening before the airplane hit the ground. But like I said, it's really rare. And that's because the airplane has to be in just about a perfect attitude and that parachute has to have caught the wind just right to open up quickly. And in addition, the pilot had to have reacted very, very quickly to the engine failure and then pulling the handle for the parachute. And we'll get more into that here when we get into the skills and training. But the point of the Facebook poster was that if you do excellent, perfect maintenance on your engine and you know how to use that two-cycle engine, if you're using a two-cycle, you shouldn't have an engine failure and thus not need a parachute at all. Well, what about airframe maintenance? Well, you really should do something like an annual inspection of your airplane, at least annual inspection. In this case, you're pretty much tearing the airplane apart looking for problems. So you're doing things like looking for cracks in tubing and rivet holes and bolt holes. You're looking for corrosion in sheet and other aluminum parts or steel parts, since corrosion weakens those parts. You're looking for loose bolts, loose rivets. You're looking for excessive wear on moving parts. Now, if you have sailcloth or fabric covering on your airplane, you're looking for deterioration of that. Make sure it's still good. And a particular sailcloth, because that can deteriorate if you leave your airplane out in the sun quite a bit. You're looking for bird, insect, and rodent nests inside your airplane because they love to make their homes in our airplanes. So if you look for all these problems and correct them, then you shouldn't have a problem with your airplane failing. So in this case, failure of parts, bonding of the control surfaces, failure of the control system, failure of structure. So if you can do these annual inspections well, take care of any problems you find, then you shouldn't have problems with the airframe. At least that's what the Facebook poster is trying to say. Now what's another thing that should be done to the airplane that some people just don't do, and that's checking your weight and balance. You gotta know where the CG of your airplane is and what the CG range, center of gravity range of your airplane is, so you don't exceed that. You get out of that CG range, you can lose control of the airplane. And some people, when they let some other pilot fly their airplane, or they put baggage in that don't normally put in, they can move that CG enough that it'll actually go outside the CG limits of the airplane. So that's not good. But if you do a good job of staying within the CG limits of the airplane, you shouldn't have any loss of control due to that issue. Now keep in mind, I'm not trying to do an exhaustive list of what to look at during an annual inspection of your airplane. Just kind of give an idea. There's certainly a lot more that you can do. But what about doing a good walk around, a good pre-flight of your airplane? Let's talk about some of the items there. So real quick, let's talk about checking the engine. On my four cycle engine, you should check the oil level, of course, see if there's any excessive leaking going on. You wanna make sure the air filter hasn't been clogged. Cables like the throttle cable, choke cable, you wanna make sure those look like they're still connected. If your exhaust has springs on them to hold it together, you wanna make sure none of those are broken. You don't want any carbon monoxide getting to the cabin of the airplane. You also wanna check for cracks, at least any large visible cracks on the exhaust. You wanna make sure wires like spark plug wires are firmly attached. It'd be good to make sure some of your temperature sensors like cylinder head temperature, exhaust gas temperature are firmly connected. That's not critical, but if you're having temperature issues with your engine while you're flying, you'll at least see those soon enough and take action to land quickly or change something like your mixture to keep problems from happening. And something, of course, that's related to the engine is checking the fuel. 
Make sure there isn't any water in your fuel. If you're using two cycle engines, you want to make sure you remember that you put correct oil mixture in your fuel. Now there's more you can do with the engine, but I just want to give you an idea there. Now let's go on to the airframe. You should check your tires, make sure the pressure is up on those and you don't have any cracks. Low pressure in your tires can cause you to veer off the side of the runway and have a little incident there. Now a pressure wouldn't have helped with that, but it's one of the things you should be doing in your pre-flight. You want to be checking easily visible nuts and bolts. Make sure that the nut's on there. Make sure, sure the bolt isn't coming out of where it should be. You want to make sure all the hinges on control surfaces, pulleys, have free and easy movement. They're not binding. If you can tell if there's excessive wear, you want to check that. You want to check, for example, if you have metal skins, make sure not, you don't have any cracking going on in any of your skins. You want to make sure there isn't any excessive play in the control system. You do that by grabbing the controls and moving them, shaking them a little bit. You want to make sure any control locks and covers on things like pitot tubes are removed. And this kind of brings to mind an incident that happened, I think it was just this last year, where a long time pilot, thousands of hours of flying, had been in the military, got in his airplane and took off and didn't unlock the control stick on his airplane. So the control locks were still in. After he took off, he kept pitching up until the airplane stalled and impacted the ground. Now I'm gonna to try to remember to come back to that incident here in a little while. Now there's a whole lot more you can do during that pre-flight, during the walk around. I want to give you an idea of the number of things that you need to look at. Let's get into pilot skills. Now I've broken it down into a couple of areas. One is decision making and the other is flying skills, training and practicing. So I'd say probably the most important one that'll keep you safe, whether you need a parachute or not, is determining when not to fly. So there might be too much crosswind across that runway for you to take off. It might be too much for your airplane. It might be too much for your skill level. And knowing those limits is good decision making and deciding not to fly because you might get yourself in trouble. Deciding not to fly when there's a low ceiling. Now the Federal Aviation Regulation has limits for what too low a ceiling is. For ultralights, we really don't have that. Although we do have limits for how far to stay away from clouds, so I guess you could say a low ceiling is a cloud. Going flying when the ceiling is really low can cause problems like flying into train, flying into radio towers. You really don't want to do that. So making a decision not to fly because the ceiling is too low be a good thing. Keep you out of trouble. You won't need a parachute. Although the issues I just mentioned, parachute probably won't do you any good when you collide into something. And what about low visibility? Something like uh, rain or fog. Now flying in those kind of conditions might be somewhere where a parachute might save you. But you shouldn't be in those conditions to start with. So that's what the original Facebook poster is trying to say. If you have good decision making, you don't need a parachute. And we can go to a few more things like flying over hostile terrain. In other words, if you have an engine out and, you, and you're pretty good at gliding, but there's no place to land, let's say that you're over a forest, over mountainous terrain, and there's no good place to land, you're gonna crash no matter where you try to sit down. A parachute might help you there, but you shouldn't have been there anyway. You should have made a decision not to go there. At least that's what the Facebook poster is trying to say. So I think that's enough about decision-making. Of course, there's more examples you could give, but let's go on to flying skills, uh, training, and practicing. So if you can make coordinated turns, in other words, not doing slips in the wrong direction, That'll help you keep out of stall spin situations. So you won't need a parachute then. And here's something that you can train for, you can practice for, and that's quickly reacting when your engine fails. It's been shown in a number of studies that a lot of pilots who have never had an engine fail on them, when it fails, it takes them seconds, numbers of seconds to decide, uh-oh, I've got a problem, I need to react, and then deciding how to react. Now, if you've done a lot of good training, you re should react in less than a second by pushing that nose forward to keep your airspeed up because we're in very high drag, very lightweight airplanes and we lose speed very, very fast, far faster than a lot of airplanes that people train in for general aviation. So we have to be even faster than them in reacting to get that nose down to keep from stalling the airplane. So dead stick landing is related to this. I mean, after your engine fails, you gotta glide to a landing spot. If you haven't practiced dead stick landing, 
In other words, learning without the engine running how far your airplane can glide or what the best attitude, pitch attitude of the airplane is in order to get a good glide. If you haven't practiced that in your airplane, you're probably going to mess up in a couple of ways. One is you'll pull back too much on the stick trying to maintain the altitude and then stall the airplane. Or you pull back quite a bit on the stick, you don't stall the airplane, but by pulling back on the stick, trying to keep that nose up, trying to maintain altitude, you're actually doing the opposite. You're slowing the airplane down so much that you've gone into a very high drag situation and you've really reduced how far you can glide. So you really need to practice that. And that leads us to the next thing. You should also practice continuously while you're flying, looking for a place to land all the time. You should be always looking around saying to yourself, if my engine died right now, where would I turn to to try to go to land? If your engine does fail then, you've already got in mind which direction to turn to go, try to go land in a safe spot. If you're not doing that, particularly if you take three to five seconds to decide you've got a problem and start pushing the nose forward, and then you start looking around for a place to land, you're using up time, a lot of time, just looking around, losing altitude while you're trying to figure out where to land. So you should always be practicing looking around where to land just in case your engine fails. But that takes practice, and it takes determination to keep doing it. So these are kind of the points that this original Facebook poster was trying to make. It didn't go into quite as much detail as I did. It's a little more high level. But if you do all these things, then the Facebook poster is saying you don't need a parachute. Now, I agree that if you do all those things, you're unlikely to need a parachute. But here's the problem. We're all human. We all make mistakes. For example, when we're doing walk-arounds and pre-flight, we might have a friend there from a neighboring hangar that's talking to us. We might get a phone call. Doing that distracts us, gets us out of our rhythm, and we could accidentally skip some vital thing we need to check. For example, that could have been something that happened to the guy I mentioned before, who was a longtime pilot and accidentally left the control locks in. He probably got distracted, probably got out of his rhythm, got out of the sequence he's usually used to doing his pre-flight, and skipped taking off the control lock. And I know from personal experience, I don't always practice all the flying skills I should, particularly when we're at low altitude and we're near sunset and we're looking for deer out in the field to look at. When we're actively looking for something else, we're not necessarily looking for a good place to land. Now we're always looking ahead to make sure that if the engine fails, that we have some place we can turn to. For example, we're not gonna run into a tree line that we should always do regardless but we might be distracted from what we should be doing. I mean, we're only human. We make mistakes. We may not do a good job on our annual inspection. We should have a checklist for all the things to check, but maybe we don't. Maybe we're just trying to go by memory. Maybe we don't keep accurate engine logs and know how long we've been flying on an engine, and maybe it needs to be overhauled and should be overhauled at 250 hours. Maybe we've gone to 350 hours, and the engine fails the next time we go up. We're human. We make mistakes. Another thing that can happen after doing repairs or doing annual inspections on the airplane, what if it's not put back the way it should be? For example, a number of times throughout history, control cables have been accidentally swapped on ailerons so that they actually go backwards from what you would expect. Now that should be caught in a pre-flight walk around when you're doing free and correct movement of the elevators and rudders and ailerons where you move them, look and see if they deflected the correct direction. Some people don't do it. Some people just think that they glance at it and think it might be right. They don't notice it's wrong and they go and take off and they have a crash. And also things that can happen on repairs or inspections. A bolt may not have been put back in as it should be. A nut may not have gotten put on a bolt as it should be. It can happen. It has happened. Even with professional repair people, sometimes they forget things, don't get a note put back on. Sometimes tools get left in an airplane, and then during flight, they move around and jam a control cable. And then another thing that can happen, I've actually witnessed this happen, a bolt can be over-torqued, putting too much torque on it, making it too tight, and that bolt head can snap off the bolt. I've been in a hangar when a bolt head popped, went zinging around the hangar, banging around making noise. 
took a while to figure out and identify where a bolt had popped off because it had been over torqued. So even professionals can make mistakes. So I think this Facebook posters doesn't really take into account that we're human, we make mistakes. And a parachute could save us in a situation that we shouldn't have gotten into, but did. So I'd say that if you are a fantastic pilot, you're fantastic at doing pre-flights, do an excellent job of maintenance, you may not need a parachute. I say the percentage of us that really are that proficient is very low. I certainly know I'm not perfect. So for those of us that are not perfect, I don't have any problem with putting the parachute on the airplane. I think it's probably a good investment. Now, let's actually go a little bit further. Now, this Facebook poster didn't consider some other scenarios, probably because it didn't fit in with his idea, but let's go over those. Now, even though you may be fantastic with your annual inspections, you may be fantastic with your pre-flights, with your walk around, fatigue cracks, other cracks can still happen. For example, there was an incident that happened in Canada. It's been a few years ago now. It was an ultralight airplane that used brackets for hold the struts to the airframe. And that bracket at the hole cracked over time and then ultimately failed with the wing departing from the airplane, of course, the airplane crashing. So trying to see that crack on the annual inspection, if you tore everything apart, you might have seen it. It was a hairline fracture. Unless you did some sort of dye penetration testing, you probably would not have seen it. And it's very unlikely you would have seen it during a walk around. Airplanes, even though they are fantastically designed, maybe there's thousands of them out on the market, maybe that have been flying for thousands and thousands of hours, there can still be issues that crop up. It happens on general aviation airplanes all the time, especially on older airplanes. Spar issues frequently crop up where you're having cracking issues and they have to be inspected and or repaired. And it's something that even the best designers of airplanes can run into. You can have all the computer modeling in the world, you can have the best designers on an airplane, and you can still come up with issues that they didn't think would happen and have failures that happen. And unfortunately, frequently, loss of life. Well, what if you're building your own airplane? Now, let's say you're using designs. It's a proven design, but you're doing the builds from plans or maybe a kit. Lots of other people have been it. It's been flying for thousands and thousands of hours. No problems. Should you put a parachute on that kind of situation? If it's your first airplane and you haven't been around, you haven't heard a lot of the horror stories, maybe you put a scratch accidentally in some of your aluminum skin and left it there. And the scratch goes right up to the edge. Well, unfortunately, that creates a stress riser in that skin and that crack can form and propagate along that scratch and it can keep going and ultimately cause a failure. Perhaps you didn't put the right material in. Maybe the plans call for 6061 T6 aluminum and you go and you find 6063 and you think, well, that sounds like the right thing. Close enough, I'll use it. Of course, that can easily cause a failure. Let's say you find something in the plans that you don't like. Maybe you think you can make it stronger than what the plans show. So you make a change. Maybe you put in a bigger bolt. Maybe you add a doubler. And you think, ah, if this is stronger, you don't need a parachute, can't get a point failure here. Of course, unless you've done some engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, or at least done a significant amount of study where you know the structure or strength of materials, you understand the stress and strain, you actually could have easily made it weaker or make it more likely to fracture in a spot that it was designed to be flexible. You made it stiff. Now you've created a stress riser. You get a failure. Well, what if you're doing a brand new design? Well, I think that's pretty simple right there. You should definitely put a parachute on in that situation. For example, where you design the UWS-4 right now. That's definitely going to have a parachute on it. So I think that's a no-brainer right there. Brand new design, never been flown before. I don't care how much aerodynamic analysis, how much structural analysis you do on it, it should have a parachute, period. So the original Facebook poster left out a lot of areas where I think it would be a fantastic idea to have a parachute. New builds of an airplane, particularly if you decide you want to make changes, a new design,
and even errors just from reassembling an airplane when you've done an annual inspection on it. We're all human, we all make mistakes. Well, that's the bulk of what I wanted to talk about. So let me kind of wrap things up a little bit here, a little summary. If you're always fly below 200, 300 feet, a parachute probably won't do you any good, period. There probably won't be enough time to the parachute deploy and save you. You're probably going to hit the ground pretty hard. Maybe not as hard as if you didn't have a parachute, but you're going to hit pretty darn hard. Unless you get extremely lucky, the airplane happens to be in a perfect attitude for deploying the parachute and having it inflate quick. That's unlikely, but it could happen. So, if you fly low all the time, you never go above, let's say, 300 feet. But how realistic is that? I mean, frequently, I fly low a lot when I fly. But every once in a while, I want to go to a neighbor's place, visit, say hi, do a little hangar flying. And so, in that case, I probably won't fly low. I'll probably go up to maybe 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet to fly over there. Sometimes in the summer, when it's really hot, it's really pleasant to go up to 5,000 feet where the cool air is, enjoying the cool summer breeze up there. So I'd say it's unlikely that someone who thinks that they're only going to fly 200, 300 feet above the ground, that that will always be the case. Maybe it will be. Now, kind of going back to this original Facebook poster's ideas, you'd have to be perfect in order for his ideas to be right where you don't need a parachute. I don't think any of us are perfect. Some of us are better than others, of course, uh, practicing our skills, reacting to engine failures, knowing what the glide distance of our airplane is, giving the altitude, doing a good job of annual inspections, always doing an annual inspection or more, doing a good job with pre-flights, with the walk around, and making good decisions on when to fly or not to fly. I mean, if you're perfect and all that, going without the parachute, yeah, okay, I, I, can, I can see that. But I don't think any of us are perfect. And then, of course, if you've built your own airplane from plans or from scratch, if you've got a brand new design that you've done, I think that parachute's probably mandatory. I think it's a bad idea not to have one. You could try to argue the case on the other things that we've talked about, but on that one, I don't think you can come up with a good rationale for not having a parachute. Well, guys, that's it for this podcast. It's been an interesting little experiment. I don't know if I'm going to do more of them, Occasionally I will. It's pretty rare that a topic comes up that I have an opinion on where I think you should or definitely should not do something. Usually there's good arguments either way. But we'll see. I may do more. Well, guys, until next time.